Good morning again. The reading this morning begins in Matthew chapter 9 and then continues into chapter 10. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, clean those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we're continuing on today with our sermon series, Kingdom of God. Let me pray. Loving Father, thank you that your word is rich and full of truth. As we delve into it today, I pray that you'll open our hearts to receive what it is that you would have us hear. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord our strength and our redeemer oh my phone's going i should have turned it off oh oh it's a spammer hello hello oh 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 look i'm I'm really sorry um oh lord lord it's you oh how amazing lord i can't believe you've called me it's so amazing what oh right how is it sitting at the right hand of the father oh it's oh right hey look i'm so sorry what i did this on yeah, you've forgiven me? Oh, thank you, Lord. That's amazing. So what? You've rung because you have a special blessing? Oh, that's amazing. You, Oh, I'm called and you're ringing me to remind me that I've been called. Oh, that's amazing, Lord. Thank you so much. Oh, what? Even people watching the live stream, they're, they're called as well? What? And and the people in the in the church here, they're called too and... Well, Lord, yes, I will. I will do that. I will. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Amazing. (laughs) The Lord rang me. He called me. He literally called me on the phone. And he called me in my life. And you know what he said? He told me that he had a message. And he wanted me to give you all a message. And the message is that you're called too, which is just incredible, isn't it? You're called as well. Um, Jesus wants me to pass on a message. That's what I stand up here and do every week, isn't it? I give a message of sorts. And today's message is what it is to be called. What does it mean to be called by God? And, and then how do we actually respond? Or how do we actually know? what that calling is. Um, That's a literal phone call. I don't think we get literal phone calls from Jesus, really. But occasionally, we'll hear something in our hearts. And the question is, do we answer? Or do we just let the call go? Let's let's think about that today. In our scripture, uh, it was partly the same scripture that we had last week. You might have picked that up. Um, But it's worth delving into a few other areas of that scripture and today I want to talk about kingdom service, 
kingdom service. Jesus says this, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, Jesus is asking us to pray and ask God to send out workers. But it's often a a scary thing to do because if we're going to pray that God will send out workers, we can't help but reflect on our own service. Are we one of the workers? Are we one of the ones who has responded to say, yes, Lord, I will go into the harvest field? What does that look like for us? For the last month, we've been talking about the kingdom of God. And I've been sharing with you, and last week I shared with you a framework or a paradigm to be able to think about this topic. So maybe we can get that up on the screen again. If you are here last week, you would have seen this. If you weren't, it might be new for you. But it's really just a paradigm to think about what Scripture is saying. This is one of the things that theologians do. They try to tease these out. And uh, in the yellow circle, in that K-O-G, that stands for Kingdom of God. And the blue circle in this Venn diagram is P-E-A, which stands for Present Evil Age. And if you can imagine that that yellow circle is moving along the directions of those two arrows, what we see is that at the cross, or even at the incarnation when Jesus became flesh, we actually saw the very kingdom of heaven invade earth. It was through the coming of Jesus that heaven came near and this is what Jesus preaches he goes into the desert comes out filled with the spirit and the message of the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven is near and not only that this is what he commands his disciples to go and preach as well we just heard that in the scriptures so essentially it was an eschatological event when Jesus was born because it was at the very moment that what had been previously separated God created the heavens and the earth, but human sin separated that in a sense. We were banished from the garden, all that kind of thing. But through Jesus, we have this reconciliation where heaven begins to invade earth once more. Now, you'll notice that there's this in-between space where it's neither blue nor yellow. It's neither dark nor light. It's actually both. And uh, this is what theologians call the already but not yet, or the now but not yet. So the kingdom of God has come, yet it feels sometimes like the kingdom of God hasn't come. We're living in an in-between space. Now, I want to pull out some scriptures to show you what this looks like. We have already been adopted in Christ. That's what the scriptures tell us. If you go to Romans chapter 8, verse 15, it says, The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Isn't that great? Yet, in the same chapter of Romans, Paul says this, We ourselves, who have the first fruits of the spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption. Does that make sense? On one level, we've been adopted, but... We wait eagerly for our adoption. That's in Romans 8. We're already redeemed in Christ. In Ephesians 1 verse 7 it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that great? But then in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, it says we're not yet redeemed. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So again, it's another instance of already, but not yet. We're already sanctified. You can go to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, but not yet sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. We're already saved in Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 8, but not yet saved. Romans 5 verse 9. The last one I'm going to read to you, we are already raised with Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 6, 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? We are seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus, but we're not. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it tells about in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. So all of these scriptures indicate this in-betweenness that we find ourselves in, in the now. It has been done in Christ, but it is not yet fully consummated. It's helpful for us to think about these things. They are paradoxes in scripture, but life is a paradox. Life has got darkness and light. Life is beautiful, but it's also terrible, isn't it? We suffer, but we have so much joy. It's a paradox. It's a a reality that we find ourselves in. We live with a theological tension. By faith in Christ, all of these spiritual blessings are already for us, but the full enjoyment of them are not yet for us. This is the life of faith. It's the life of faith to have, as Hebrews says, the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Now, the good news is that Jesus told us that the kingdom of heaven is near. So, really, it comes down to us to have that faith expectation to be able to take that step needed to essentially reach out to God and say, Lord, I'm stepping out in faith to enter into, to reorient myself back to you and to trust in you. See, we can be facing the blue, we can be facing the things of this present evil age, or we can have our orientation towards the KOG, the kingdom of God. It's a matter of choice. It's a matter of priorities in our life. This is what we talked about last week, isn't it? We talked about kingdom presence. If we want the presence of the kingdom, why are we focused on the present evil age? Why are we focused on all the negative things happening in the world, the negative things happening in our life, rather than having faith and trust in the source of all life, the living God? It's about our orientation. If we're oriented toward God, we're going to see more of the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus was standing right in front of the people that he said, The kingdom of heaven is near. And literally all they needed to do was to reach out and touch him. And they would have experienced the kingdom. People did that and they were healed. But you have to do that by faith. You have to step out by faith. So kingdom presence and today kingdom service, these two areas, I believe they go hand in hand. We all agreed last week that we want the kingdom of heaven. We want, we want to experience God in our midst. We wouldn't be here today unless we wanted to see God. You might be here because you already have a faith in God, a trust in God, or you might be someone who's seeking God and wants to experience something different, wants to experience something of God. So you've come here. So we all come for the same reason, essentially. Because God is good. He wants to give good gifts to his children and it's wonderful when the power of the Holy Spirit does fall on us. It's wonderful when we do experience the presence of God, some kind of inspiration or creativity or uh, knowledge, wisdom, all the gifts of the Spirit and we long for these things as Christians. We want to be blessed and I want to tell you it's not a bad thing to want to be blessed. It's not a bad thing to ask God for what you want and what you need. I truly believe that if our motivations are in the right place, God responds with a yes and amen to the things we ask for. We can ask for the desires of our heart. Remember the brother of Jesus, James, in his book, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. It's okay to ask. And Jesus was very explicit himself. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Now, this is what we're asking for. We're asking for the things of heaven. 
We're asking for the blessing of God to fall upon us. And it's okay and it's good to ask for these things. It's entirely appropriate because our Father wants to give good gifts to His children. This is straight out of the Scriptures. And because the Kingdom of Heaven is near, we can access those things through faith. Now, I'm really just repeating a lot of what I said last week. But this is the difference. What I want to suggest today is that the presence of the kingdom becomes manifest and goes hand in hand with how we actually serve. How we actually serve God. You might imagine that in my position, I get the opportunity to speak to lots of different people. And oftentimes people come to me when they've got something going on in their life that's a challenge or hard. Sometimes it's about their work. You know, we all have struggles with people or struggles with sense of promotion or our identity. Um, It might be about their home life, about their relationships, their closest relationships. Mental health is a big one as well. And I prayerfully listen to people and I offer comfort and uh, we pray, pray together. And look, the vast majority of people get through the challenges that come along. Um... But often people come back. They come back with another challenge or they come back with the same challenge that they previously had. And I'd say nine times out of ten, the reason people have got themselves into a pickle is because their focus is not on God or the things of the kingdom. I think naturally we're inward focused people. We tend to go in rather than out. We tend to try and solve the problems inwardly rather than relying outwardly on God's work. And the kicker with that, and this is the really important part, when we're focusing inwardly, we become very self-serving, very self-serving. And often those same people come back with another problem or the same problem. And my observation, and I'm, I'm not trying to sound negative or judgmental here, it's just an observation, is that often there's a sense that they're predominantly focusing on themselves rather than God or others. And the Bible teaches us to really get our eyes off ourselves and to start loving others. It's, a, it's a, a choice. It's an act of faith that we have to decide we want to do. And I say that uh, not out of judgment. It's just an observation, but it is worth unpacking it a little bit. People love God. These, these people love God. They want to serve God, but instead of actively stepping into some kind of service which is outside of themselves or outside of their own interests, the majority of the activities, the actual things they are doing in their lives is all about them. Now, that's what I notice. What they probably don't realise is that in order to serve God in this world and to get our eyes off ourselves is to actually serve other people, to step outside of our own bubble and to get our eyes onto the needs of others to get our eyes on what it might be that God is calling us to if your focus is on yourself your needs your own desires your own ambitions and it's about uh, you then at some point you're you're going to come unstuck Rather, we should be focusing on God and saying, well, Lord, what is my calling? What am I called to? What have I been created for? What is my purpose? Because God has a purpose and a call for each one of you to serve him in some way, shape or form. And most times it's about serving your brothers and sisters in Christ or serving in some capacity outside of the church. One of my favourite scriptures comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, 
for good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Does everyone know that one? I love that verse. I don't don't like the NIV. We have the NIV version here and I don't like the NIV because I don't think it actually captures the, the, the astounding nature of that verse. It says we are God's poema. I'm a terrible Greek. I can't speak Greek very well, but a very Australian accent. Poema, which, which is, we are God's masterpiece. We are God's create, creative work, you know, to do good works. That's, that poema is where you get the word poem, you know. We are God's masterpiece, God's creative work, which means that God lovingly thought about you before you were even created. God lovingly designed you before you were even conceived. You were conceived in the mind of God before you were literally conceived on the earth. That's pretty amazing. God created you for a purpose. And we're living in this context as God's creation of the already but not yet. So we can't exactly see the purpose for which God created us. And some people get themselves in such a pickle that they don't even love themselves because they don't see themselves as God's creation, as a good thing, as a masterpiece. They see themselves through the light of the present evil age because their focus is in the blue section. And I want to tell you that if that's you... I want, to, I want to ask you to, to turn around and begin to focus on God and what he says about you. Get some good truth of scripture about who you are and what God's created you for and things will change, absolutely. We can discover what God's purpose is for us. We can discover God's call because we have been given the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has been sent to the church that we might hear the very Word of God. And what I mean is not talking about just the Bible, but we can be praying and and the Lord God can drop an idea or the Lord God can give you a word or something pops up in your spirit and you say, that wasn't me. Where did that idea come from? What's, What's this going on? This is a gift of the Spirit to be able to hear what God says of you. Sometimes God speaks to you through one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you are too clouded to hear what God is saying for yourself, God will send somebody to say, I've got a word of, word of knowledge for you. I've got a word for you. Or someone might be praying for you and they will be able to give you an encouragement that you need. God speaks to us because the Spirit of God is here. We believe that here at St Paul's. That's why we have prayer counselling after the service so that you can go up and you can say, I've got a need and I want to hear from God. I want the heavens to come down on earth and invade my life. I want change. I want transformation. I'm here because I want to encounter Jesus. Amen. That's what I want. We have access to the very word of God. And often... You know, in this, in this in-between space, we're saying, Lord, who am I? Lord, what is it that you've called me to do? What's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? That's the age-old question, you know. Uh, it's a question that the ancient psalmist cries out. Psalm 8. Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens... Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. The psalmist is asking that question, who are we? Who who am I? What is it that when I look at this universe, what is my place here? We're clouded because we're living in the now, but not yet. We can't fully see. But the Spirit of God reveals it to us. I once heard a pastor say that people go around the mountain. You know, we want to climb the mountain, 
But so often we're going round and round the mountain. And it's because our focus is not upward. Our focus is downward. It's a good, a good metaphor to be thinking about. Are you going in your life around and around the mountain? Where is your head pointing? I don't know if we've got the other slide, Rich. This one's a bit different. It's the same picture but on a sideway view. It's only theoretical, okay? This is not... It's only to help us get a, a bit of an understanding. But the kingdom of God comes down. If you read Revelation, at the end of all things, you know, it talks about the heaven, the, the he, a new heaven coming down, doesn't it? And this is a kind of a picture of that, the kingdom of God coming down. But we, if our focus is down... We're not seeing what's coming from above, are we? We've got to orient our hearts upward to be having our minds focused on God, focused on the things of heaven. Some people have a very clear understanding about what God's called them to. They know that they've been created for a purpose. Um, maybe, maybe some people here know that. And, and they're not doing something about it, maybe knowing what God's called you to. For me, I've been called into ministry for many, many years, and for years and years and years, I didn't say yes to God. It took my wife actually turning around to me and saying, Brendan, you're never happy. Well, you've got to go and do theology and get into the ministry because it's all you ever talk about, and you don't, you don't even do it, right? And that was me. That could be you. That could be you. Is that you? You know what God wants you to do, but you're just not doing it. What I've discovered is often the case with people is that we sit around and we wait for God to do it. We sit around waiting for God to do something. Show me, Lord. Show me first, Lord. Show me first and then I'll go. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. It works this way. It works by actually us taking a step and doing something. Even if it's not what God has called you to, you step in, you say, well, I'm going to do this. Because when you do that, God will go, oh, thank goodness, they're finally moving. Now you go that way, right? <laughs> That's kind of how I think it works, you know. We need to take a step. We need to say, Lord, I'm really not sure if this is it. I'm stepping in faith. Right, okay, it wasn't that hard after all, was it? Or we can just sit around waiting for God to do something. But nothing's going to happen when you sit around. Maybe the best way to take a step forward to find out what it is that God has called you to is to start serving in the context of your local church. And I know we've got a great level of engagement here. Many people serve in many different areas and, and that's a wonderful thing. But, you know, when you begin to serve, all of a sudden you realise that, well, actually, I, I'm doing this, but I really feel God's wanting me to do that. Come and talk to me. Let's make that happen. Because my desire as a pastor is to see people doing the things God's called them to do, not just doing something because they feel they're filling a gap or, oh, there's a need, therefore I'll go and do it. I hate it, but I'll do it anyway. That's not what the church is about. You learn this when you do network, don't you, Roseanne? You do. Go and do network. It's good. But to say this, we want to find out what our call is and to be stepping into that place. And when you begin to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ you actually begin to experience the presence of God because God is found in the present within one another. The Spirit is within you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. If you want to experience the kingdom, get alongside a brother or sister in Christ and start doing something together and it will begin to unfold in your life. Kingdom service and kingdom presence go hand in hand. But this is it. It's about making service to God, worship to God, the number one priority. 
years ago, and probably many of you here still do this, we talk about being Christ-centred. You know, we would pray prayers like, Lord Jesus, I want to be found in the centre of your perfect will. Anyone remember praying that prayer? Lord Jesus, I want to be found in the very centre of your perfect will for my life. That's asking God to do something quite scary because God's will for you may not be what you're doing right now. Have you all forgotten that Jesus called me at the start of the the start of this message? He's called me to call you. He's called me to call you, to call you into service to the King through serving your brothers and sisters in the church. And the question I have is, who are you serving right now? Who are you serving? Who is your master? Are you serving yourself? Are you a self-serving person? Is it your family, your spouse, your home, your boss? Now, I know life's busy. And sometimes when I ask these questions, people say, but Brendan, you just don't realise how busy life is. I do. I'm living it too. But at the end of the day, it comes down to priorities and choices. Are we really wanting to, uh, to pray that prayer? Lord, may I be found in the very centre of your perfect will. Is that a genuine prayer? Because if it is, God might say, well, if that's the case, you need to think about what you're doing with your time because you've only got a limited amount of it. At the end of the day, it comes down to the things that are our priorities or our idols. The things we're serving, are our idols are what we serve. If you want to know who your God is, look at where you're spending your time and your money and you'll soon work it out. There's some people sitting in this place today who God has called into full-time ministry. I know it for fact. And it might be that you're sitting there going, well, I do too, but I've just never told anybody that. Come and see me. Come and see me. The church needs leaders. The church needs leaders as we step into the future that we have in this, in this nation and the world. There are some people in this place today who want to do more in the church but are just not sure how. And if that's you, come and see me too. And we'll work that out together. And I certainly know that there are some people in this church that are not happy with the way certain things are done and would like them done in a different way. I know because I get emails and I get anonymous letters and all kinds of things. Just to know, anonymous letters go straight in the rubbish bin. If that's you, you want to change, come and talk to me. But, you know... If God wants to send, we ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field, it might be that you're the change <laughs> and you need to change your priorities rather than having an opinion about how things are done, get in and start doing it. Serving the kingdom. Either way, come and see me. In my heart of hearts, I'm seeking God's presence for our church. Um, there's a way... Something tells me that the only way we're really going to know the presence of Christ is by serving one another and serving our community and serving the world. If we love one another, then we serve one another. How can we know one another? How can we love one another if we don't know one another? How do we know one another? By being together, by doing things together by serving one another. This is the church being knit together and truly reflecting the very body of Christ. That's my prayer for us. The Lord be with you.